Good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to the Curing Public Space webinar from the CHT West Midlands. My name is Ramon Agudoporas, and I am a member of the CHT West Midlands Committee. Um, if you could move to the next slide, please. So this is like a short um, agenda for what we're going to cover today. Just to start to start like a short introduction to CHT, presentation of our like guest speakers. Um, then afterwards, after the presentation, we'll we'll have like a question and answer session and a summary. Next, please. Yeah. Um, so oh, could you go to, back to yeah? That's one. That's that's one. Thank you. Uh, just a quick summary to like to explain to those who are not familiar with CHT. Uh, CHT is a charter institution of highways and transportation. It's a charity and a professional membership body with uh, more than fourteen thousand members with Nash, um, with um, um, organisations or on uh, different committees in the um, in twelve UK regions and nations, and also um, across the whole globe in different countries. Um, and was awarded the Royal Charter in two thousand and nine. Next slide, please. Uh, there's a plenty of reasons to becoming a member uh, if you are not a member already. But for me, particularly, I think the the the, the breadth and depth of like uh, different disciplines you can like. Uh, see represented in CHT is key, but uh, also the, the the access to professional qualifications and um, industry recognition, and it's like uh, also for me at least, like I found that uh, the capacity or the ability to get in, engaged uh, with CHT is a lot better than, than in other like um, organizations. So that's for me like what's like the best uh, things of of like being part of CHT. Next slide, please. So um, I've been the uh, CHT West Midland uh, West, Mid West Midlands EDI rep since 2020, and what we try to do in the in the West Midlands is trying to support the CHT um, EDI charter by promoting events uh, covering the whole breadth of EDI the EDI space, inclusive of gender, race, sexuality, and disability. Um, we are trying to encourage other UK CHT committees to do the same thing to have like a dedicated rep that uh, covers and looks after EDI in, in the regions. And I would like just to encourage all the attendees, if you really want to un understand what we do in the EDI space, or if you want to collaborate, or you want to see like different or new kind of events, please like contact me in the, the email you can see. You can see that because I'm really always looking for like a new, new events, new ideas, like that can actually help EDI in the region. Uh, next slide, please. So, without further delay, um, I'm introducing uh, the webinar, uh, as I said, Queering Public Space. Um, uh, thank you so much to Amar Asus, Professor um, Pipa Katro Lameji Man Orem, to agree to present uh, this today. Um, uh, we, we're doing this to, to celebrate International Day Against um, Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia, which is Idaho Beat Day. So, as I said, without further delay, I'm going to um, pass the presentation to uh, Professor Pippa Catherall, uh, which is going to start the presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, um, here we have the first slide. Thank you all very much for coming and as uh, and thank you to Ramon as well for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Um, so, it's, it's very easy to think of public space as something which is neutral. After all, we all need to access it. We all need to um, live in it. But for many people, public space is not public. It's not, uh, it's, it feels like a hostile environment to them. It's one where they run the gauntlet of abuse and aggression, where they feel conspicuous, where they feel excluded. Um, and this doesn't just apply to LGBTQ people, the kind of people we're, we're thinking about particularly today, it also applies to all of those protected characteristics. So in, in our research for this, when we were talking to people from Stop Hate UK, they were talking about disabled people who we often think of front and centre when we're talking about inclusive design for the public realm are also the ones who are most excluded by hostile uh, behaviours in the public realm or hostile design in the public realm. So when we're talking about queering public space, we're talking about getting away from space being exclusive and trying to make it as inclusive as possible 
warmth and welcoming as possible for everyone. Next slide, please. So our journey to this uh, research and the report which we published yesterday uh, on queering public space, I started with me giving this talk at Arup in London in February last year. And one of the things we wanted to do here was talk about how do we get from this situation of hostility and indeed imposed conformity in public space. If you think about it, planning systems historically have involved ideas that uh, suburbia is about families. And what happens if you don't fit into that family model? Well, like my friends who lived on a suburb of Reading a few years ago, you might get firebombed. Um, so, which is of course not a terribly desirable outcome. Um, so the, the encoded heteronormativity of some of these spaces helps to produce hostility helps to produce hate incidents and hate crimes. And even when you're looking at spaces which are known for being queer friendly and so on, like Brighton, for instance, uh, if you read Juliet, Jake, uh, Juliet Jake's memoir of transitioning in Brighton, um, there are frequent references to the abuse she received on the street. So we started thinking about, well, what can we do to uh, address this? What can we do to address the problem that you have so many people who uh, actually don't feel comfortable in large parts of public space? Indeed, some LGBT groups avoid whole areas of cities completely because of the sense of hostility. Um, and that set us to thinking about, well, what makes public space more inclusive? Next slide, please. So here we have a, an article from uh, Peter Carmona from uh, three years ago in which he tried to talk about what would make for inclusive public space. Um, now, for those of you who are uh, more focused upon uh, highways and transportation, you might be thinking, well, you know, these are perhaps open spaces, but I think it applies to, uh, to those spaces as well. Um, one of the things which came out from our research was the way in which the shape, the nature of roads actually affected how included people felt. Um, there's an, a line in a recent history, uh, a recent book called A Queer New York, um, which talks about when I get to Sixth Avenue, which is a huge thoroughfare through uh, Manhattan, um, I always drop my girlfriend's hand because of the sudden sense of visibility and the sense that here we are standing out. In this slide, I've got a picture of two girls kissing. What about being able to express affection? What about being able to hold your partner's hand? What about being able to do things that heteronormative people, heterosexual people feel um, are absolutely fine? for them to do, whereas LGBTQ people are constantly having to, quote, edit themselves in public space so as to avoid hostility. Um, one of the paradoxes we found was, as a result, frequently LGBTQ people need more privacy in public space. They need what some of our respondents in our surveys talked about as cosy corners, places where you could see, but not be seen. Um, next slide, please. And this is not, le not least to avoid the rather chilling statistic that you see on this slide. Now, I, I think this is actually, um, this is of course in London heading towards the Tate Modern. It is, um, and the Millennium Bridge. Um, it is of course uh, a fairly welcoming um, space with lots of diverse sight lines, lots of diverse uh, street furniture um, and uh, roof lines and so on. But uh, in general, it seems to us that there is a problem of how do you desist this hate crime? How do we address 
the problem that there is so much of this hate crime. That I'm going to just make two points about hate crime before I hand over to Amar. There hasn't been a great deal of research on the location of hate crime, but one of the things which which has been identified is what's called a neighbourhood effect. This affects all groups who suffer from hate crime, including misogynistic hate crime, um, which is that the perpetrators of hate crime frequently target people who they recognise as being local to the area, but they regard as out of place. They stick out because they do not conform to models of masculinity or of ableism or whatever, and they get targeted. So one thing to think about is how do we create spaces which are in, in which diversity is encoded into the um, uh, into the built environment so that those kinds of reactions are not expressed because we also know that um, it is relatively easy to desist people who are drawn to committing hate crimes. Um, so um, one of the things to do is to look at how spaces can and or cannot create this kind of problem. And now I'm going to hand over to Amar for the next bit of the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Pippa, for uh, the uh, introduction. And before I carry on with the slides, I just want to say thanks a lot for the organizers today, uh, for the people who have made the time to join, and also for my colleagues who have shaped this project as a, a collective um, effort, uh, including Matt Dillon and May, who is also um, chairing the Q&A today. I'm an architect by training, and I'm based in London office in Arab. Um, so what's wonderful about this project, and I think one of the, uh, the exciting things is that uh, our positionality, Pippa and myself, is that we're trying to bridge between the academia and practice um, instead of staying in one's own uh, room, as, uh, as we say. Uh, can I have uh, the next slide, please? I think like at the start of the project, we wanted to explore what's happening in this uh, literature and the work that has been done so far. And I think in the last few decades, couple of decades, there has been a lot of interest in, in the subject of queer geographies and queer spaces uh, approached from different perspectives, including uh, historians, uh, geographers, architects and urban planners. And there are some exciting books uh, that I put a sample of them and we've been uh, really privileged and lucky to uh, to speak to some of uh, the key authors in this field uh, in a, a few round tables that we organized in December and then in one-to-one -one interviews that we have conducted with uh, many of these academics. So I'm just highlighting this because it's also a part of the process of conducting this uh, research has been uh, extremely beneficial to speak to, to these experts and these academics. But I think in what we, uh, Pippa and myself and the team have been keen to explore is how do we uh, shift uh, the great work that academics are doing from um, research into practice? How can we engage with practitioners? And I think uh, what was also exciting in this project, our approach towards not only interviewing academics, uh, but a lot of practitioners and people working as activists or uh, uh, design, uh, lighting designers, architects, urban planners, trying to see how we can uh, shift the, uh, the, the conversation from research into practice. The next slide, please. There have been multiple um, um, uh, uh, multiple elements or multiple characteristics, let's say, um, about what we think uh, could impact on uh, the querying of a space, um, querying of public space, and particularly one of the elements that I'm personally interested in is um, the question of representation and power dynamics, and memory and heritage in a space. And i.e. is who has the right to be remembered in a space, who has the right to be seen, uh, who do we remember in our cities through street names, building names, square names, through statues, uh, signs, um, uh, blue plagues, and I think one of the, the, the realities, one of the, the work that we have found done by one of the charities in the UK, looking at the number of statues in the UK, they have found that one out of five statues in the UK is of women. And very often these women are nameless, very often 
um, semi-naked, let's say. But I think imagine this um, much more um, less focus on the queer communities. So I'm showing you here in, in Bloomsbury, which is something that we highlighted in the report. Um, and I hope uh, May or one of my colleagues could post a link of the, the report and also the video is in Bloomsbury, uh, which we give some uh, examples in Bloomsbury in London, uh, where you have a, a square called Tavistock uh, Square Gardens. At the heart and the center of it, there's a statue of Gandhi, uh, a male uh, statue. Um, and then you have in a tiny corner, Virginia Woolf, who, who lived in the area and also in different parts of London at different stages of her life. But it's in a corner, almost hidden. Um, it isn't as central as such. And very often, even when you have a statue of a, a queer person, let's say Alan Turing in near Paddington or even in the gay village in Manchester, um, very often um, the identity is the sexual orientation of these uh, individuals um, is not noted. Um, so they are celebrated and the celebration is selective uh, as well. So I'm interested in this question of who is remembered in the city. And I think it's very important to, to be represented for queer communities to see that uh, this history is not erased. Next slide, please. Some of the examples also that uh, was uh, highlighted in Bloomsbury in London was Marshman Street and also Bloomsbury as such, where you have um, a sign in the left um, photo here on the Bloomsbury group where Virginia Woolf was also part of. Um, and uh, also they, they were famous. Uh, multiple people say they lived in squares and loved in triangles. So they had uh, multiple relationships, uh, same sex relationships. Um, and um, how uh, important to tell the story uh, of these communities who live in these areas and to celebrate it and to bring it to the um, cautiousness um, of the memory uh, of these spaces. And just to pause here a little bit, uh, if anyone uh, has a question or a comment or reflection as we go in the presentation, do feel free to add your uh, question or reflection or insight in the chat box. And also here we show on the on the right, um, there is that the gay is the word. Uh, if you're in London and familiar with the place, it's uh, the oldest LGBTQ bookshop in, in the UK. Um, and above it, there is a small blue plaque of uh, Martin uh, Ashton, who, is, uh, who was an activist, um, and also br bringing these memories, bringing these elements, uh, contribute to, uh, to creating more inclusive um, um, collective memory, if, if, if you would like to say, in, in the city. Next slide, please. I think it's a quite a cliche that many uh, organizations, uh, many companies, even planners, they think that uh, putting the rainbow, uh, rainbow flag somewhere, especially in February month, um, um, is the, the solution. And I think this has been reflected in many uh, streets and places globally. Um, we have seen this in Camden, for instance, in London, as in the bottom left uh, photo, and also in other parts of London, as in the bottom right, um, in the rainbow crossing uh, points. Um, I have spoken to people who some of them they say uh, I feel safe and included because I feel this street, this space is welcoming me. Other people would argue that this is a, a tiny superficial contribution and um, there are con contrasting uh, opinions about the flags uh, that uh, many would think a queering is um, putting a flag and that's it. But I think hopefully in the report, if you have the chance to, to look at our report and also the film that accompanies uh, the project, is that we really think uh, of moving beyond the neighborhood, uh, which is the, the queer neighborhood. We do think that uh, we need to, to move beyond uh, the rainbow flag to, to think about the multiple design elements uh, looking at uh, ideas of uh, um, colors, materials, uh, structures, uh, the, the scale of the building, uh, the roads that we, we are going through, the, uh, the furniture, the statues. So we, we make a statement on the need to preserve the heritage and memory of, uh, of uh, queer histories and to move beyond the big neighborhood. Uh, next slide, which is the last, uh, or maybe uh, before the last, before I give him back to, uh, to Peter. Uh, one of the, uh, the the arguments that we also try to make um, in this project, um, sorry, I'm not sure if we move to the next slide, please. 
is that uh, a lot of these bases um, grow organically um, and very often there are grassroots initiatives done by the communities, done by activists to reclaim the history of uh, queer communities um, as in this project done by uh, Dr. Kit Hayem with their colleagues, uh, which is on the, the rainbow plaque. So you see in London or in the UK where you have a, a, a blue plaque saying, ah, oh, this person lived here in that year. So what Kit uh, have done, is that reclaiming that history, uh, inviting people to, to tell the story of queer communities who, uh, when the history is almost silenced or erased and trying at a certain moment of the time to go doing like DIY practices in order to reclaim that history. And I think it's a, it's a very powerful uh, tool to tell the story when uh, the story is often kept silenced. Uh, the last uh, one before I hand it to Pippa, and it's a question for everyone attending, is where do you feel safe in your city um, and included? And can you name a space? Um, and if so, uh, why? Uh, so it's the question in the next slide, please. Um, so I'm just gonna pause here for 10 seconds and say, again, where do you feel safe in your city? Uh, can you name a space and why? I'm not sure uh, where everyone is joining from, but if you have any places, and you can tell us a few sentences, um, uh, that would be really appreciated. Um, I'm gonna uh, be silent for 10 seconds, no pressure, no need to, to get uh, responses now, um, and then I can hand them to Pippa. Pippa for you, thank you. Thank you. Um, can we have the next slide please, Katie? So, um, I mean, just following on from one of the things that Amar was saying, um, I remember talking to a friend who uh, said to me recently, you, you go to Pride and it's just a celebration and it's not a protest anymore. But we're talking about a country where the hostility to being LGBTQ has recently started going up again. The number of people in the architecture profession who are willing to uh, be openly out at work has been going down. Um, and you, uh, in the latest survey, 10% of the population believes that being um, queer is always wrong. There are 71 countries around the world where it's illegal to be uh, a gay male and 43 countries around the world where it's illegal to be a lesbian. And that's not even getting into how many countries it's illegal to be trans in. Um, so the, the amount of hostility in human society to people who have always existed, people who are, who are part of human society, is still quite astonishing. Um, not only that, but we've also seen a disappearance of queer spaces, or perhaps I should say queer places. So within queer space, there are places where people can be themselves. Um, and uh, among other people uh, who uh, are uh, similar. And you have two examples on here. She is the only remaining lesbian bar in London on Old Compton Street. Um, the uh, Joiners Arms closed down a few years ago in East London. There's been a very active campaign to try and save it. And the local planning authority, Tower Hamlets, has recently um, written into its code that uh, it should be replaced with another queer amenity. 58% um, of queer venues in London have been lost in the last decade. Um, and uh, it's nice to see this kind of thing happening. One of the points we're trying to make in this report though, is that we need to get beyond just thinking about the odd amenity. Not all queer people go to pubs. Not all queer people are, uh, drink. Um, and so you still need other kinds of locations for people where you can get support. Uh, you need locations where you can get, um, where you can meet the distinctive needs of elderly LGBTQ people who often do not have the family support networks that exist for other parts of society. So it's important to think beyond a fairly limited approach to planning. And one of the things we found is that planning authorities where we could find evidence really don't take into account the needs of groups with particular 
protected characteristics when they're thinking about how do we design a new road? How do we design a new space? How do we do the planning brief for this particular development? And it's important that those kinds of issues are increasingly addressed. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? Um, it's not just about uh, thinking about planning or licensing, so avoiding creating mono uh, nighttime monocultures of hard drinking uh, places. I used to live in a village, tiny village with 43 licensed premises. Um, and so it was very male, it was very aggressive. Um, it, <laughs> And it was very unpleasant at certain times of the year when people drank even more than usual. Um, so it's um, it's important to think about how the authorities create spaces which are hostile to large numbers of members of the public. It's not acceptable that so many women feel that after dark, essentially they're excluded from public spaces. Or, or they have to um, be guarded by a man in order to traverse those kinds of spaces. And even then they can still get targeted. So one of the things we needed to think about was how, how do you design in diversity and desist those hate incidents that we've talked about? You can see here two images. One is from Marais in Paris. The one at the bottom is Newtown, uh, which is a neighborhood in Sydney, Australia. Um, one of them shows lots of different uh, design features, so lots of colour, lots of ambient light, um, different kinds of uh, facades and structures, street furniture. So what you've got, I mean, you haven't got it in this particular picture, but you've got the elements to create more footfall. More footfall creates more social capital. More social capital creates more diversity. More diversity desists hate crime. Um, if you look at uh, Newtown, we talked to a queer geographer who lives in Newtown and he said, well, one of the things which comes out of here is that people like this area because the roads are relatively small scale. Uh, that tends to slow the traffic. It tends to mean that you can do more looking. You can see the roof lines are varied. There's a varied facade. The roads curve. And in, a, in some of the uh, literature we were looking at, curvy roads. I mean, obviously, this is not something that I could necessarily sell to your average highway uh, engineer, but curvy roads in relatively residential spaces can be ways of reducing that neighbourhood effect I was talking about earlier, of, of cr uh, crime within the local neighbourhood, of people you recognise as queer. Um, so I think all of those are design features that we wanted to pick out here. Can we have the next slide, please? So Amaz already asked you a question. I want to ask you a question as well and, and, and invite you to pose uh, uh, responses in the chat. You have here an image from Newtown, Australia. And I want you to think about what design features make a streetscape and or its soundscape more inclusive. One of the things which uh, which strikes me as well is we, we need to think about design in its totality. We need to think about how you design streetscapes which are not just for the motorist but also for the pedestrian so that there is plenty of ambient light on the uh, pavements which make it safer for vulnerable groups to traverse them. Um, because one of the things which is very striking is that harshness of lighting creates puddles of light and dark. It's the warmth of lighting, it's the quality of lighting, it's the positioning of lighting, which can help to make these uh, spa spaces more inclusive. Soundscapes can also be very exclusionary. If you think about how noise carries in an echoing vast public space um, and makes you feel vulnerable um, and very visible, when you hear a noisy group of people crossing that space. Um, so that's one of the things which uh, I, I think we want to well flag up as, as well. And again, noisy thoroughfares clearly are not queer spaces. Uh, next slide, please. So 
one of the things we're, we're, we're picking out is that uh, there are various ways in which we think you can try and queer public space. Um, you can have um, fairly quirky designs. So at the bottom corner here, you have quote, the lesbian capital of the north of England, Hebden Bridge. Um, you have the splashes of colour, the, um, the water features, the uh, winding pathways of South Bank. Um, and in the middle, you have Centenary Square, uh, which has just been which is just being completed in Birmingham, where you have curvilinear features of the new tram, you have a varied roof line, you have, as you can see, water features, variation of scale, um, variation of sight lines, patches of greenery. It's still more open than I would like, but I think it's closer to those cosy corners, to that broken broken up space which helps to produce that lack of visibility, lack of standing out in public space, which tends to make uh, marginalised groups more vulnerable. Um, final slide, please. Actually, this might be the final slide. Yeah, final slide is, um, that was us. Uh, so my name is Pippa Catra. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a trans academic who works at the University of Westminster. My colleague has been Amar Azuz, who's a wonderful person from Arup and the University of Oxford. Thank you very much for listening. Have you got any questions? Over to you, May, to manage that. Do you want us to go to the film, uh, Pippa? We could do if, if, if people haven't got questions at the moment, while people are thinking of any questions they might have. So do you I want think, to share yeah, let's, let's go with the film for the time being, give people a chance to um, to drop their questions in. Yeah. If we uh, wanted to kick off with some questions, I think let's let's move on to that. Um, so just before we do that, um, just wanted to thank uh, Amar and Pippa for the wonderful presentation um, and also just quickly introduce myself to the audience as well. So my name's May, uh, my pronouns are she and her and I lead the Access and Inclusive Environments team at Arup um, and we specialise in inclusive design and how we can design spaces that reflect the needs of the wonderfully diverse societies that we inhabit. Um, and as Pippa and Amar meant, uh, noted in their presentation, inclusive design is about understanding how to design well so that everyone, uh, you know, so that it, it can be used by everyone. Um, and designing to code um, is, is just not enough. You know, co codes are based on averages, uh, which are not representative, they're often outdated, um, and they're restricted in what they cover as well and who they cover um, the, the parameters for. Um, so before we jump onto the questions, just wanted to share a couple of comments um, in relation to the question that Amar posed earlier on, on uh, where people feel safe in, in terms of where they live at the moment. Um, so uh, one audience member uh, mentioned that they live in uh, rural Scotland um, and the place that they feel most safe is far away from uh, or far from populations, for example, in the hills, in the woods, etc. Um, another uh, audience member mentioned uh, that they feel safer in the gay quarter, but still refrain themselves from holding their boyfriend's hand. Um, so just wanted to share those and to uh, say thank you for sharing those thoughts as well. Um, feel really privileged to have been working with Piffa and Amma on this. I'm really excited to open up the discussion with you all. So just a reminder, drop drop questions into the questions box um, and I can read those out for you. Um, and whilst you're doing that, if I can kick off with a question um, to you both. Um, so a lot of the LGBTQ plus spaces have been disappearing. And so what or how, how do you think we should be protecting what remains of that history and how can we celebrate that history today in our cities? Okay, well, one way in which you, um, in which that is being addressed in um, London is uh, that there is now in some uh, authorities playing guidance to uh, protect particular amenities. There was a, 
uh, a plan to take down a, a gay venue in 2019 and it got turned down at the inspectorate on those grounds um so there, there are ways in which you, that can be done but it's not it's not the ideal way of doing it it seems to me that there are a whole series of, of wider problems so you look at um gay enclaves across the world one of the characteristics of them is very often the living accommodation is rented, it's not freehold, um, the properties are also rented, and of course, in the end, there are more straight people. Therefore, there's a bigger market for straight people. And if you look at the kind of uh, gay villages that have developed, like you know, Manchester, these started off as liminal spaces. They were run down formerly industrial areas, which then became red light districts, which then became um, uh, populated by gay, uh, gay males who took advantage of the cheap rent, moved in, gentrified and improved them. The, the problem is that that tends to lead to a concentration of a gay white males rather than more general because they tend to be the work richest part of the community um, and you don't uh, they're vulnerable to changes in market so gentrification leads to the movement of what were formerly gay venues into becoming street venues um, and you know, even the so-called gay venues in London, frequently you go to them and half of them, half the people there are straight anyway. Um, Pride in London is essentially a straight event these days, um, which is fine, but um, it's, I mean, one needs allies, but it means that uh, the, these spaces have diminished. So it's, it's not just about planning, it's also about thinking about uh, property prices, uh, it's thinking about how you preserve uh, locations and how you move to more organic forms of organisation. I mean, so much uh, of planning is very uh, top down, very organised, um, and very much in favour of capitalistic develop big developers. And current changes proposed in the Queen's speech the other day will, I suspect, just make things worse. But you know, that's another thing. I think just want to add quickly that um, I was last week in the Canal Street in Manchester in the gay village at the neighborhood, uh, if you like to, to say. And uh, my last visit before that was less than two years ago. And last week, I just noticed the radic radical reshaping of the street, the Canal Street, uh, uh, which is always uh, full of um, restaurants and bars and buildings of maybe three to four uh, floors maximum. And now many of these places on the other side of the canal have been knocked down and been replaced by tower blocks for the few rich and the elites, um, maybe tower block of 10 to 15 uh, floors. And I think what, what we notice in the literature and what we see that um, a lot of these uh, places that they grow organically by the communities, they suddenly become very attractive to tourists. And not only tourists, they are becoming very attractive to property investors who have the money and the power. Um, and sadly, with uh, this um, redevelopment or whatever uh, urban renewal you want to call it, a lot of these spaces are um, demolished and replaced by um, properties for the rich. And hence the people who used to live or uh, visit these sites would no longer be uh, visiting or able to, to be in these places. So it's really shocking to see uh, this happening. Um, so that's one point on how to, to, uh, to, to think about protection. How do we uh, think of, about having uh, places for the communities uh, not for the, the few rich. And I think another point is the term that we use queering, which is as a verb uh, and not as a, a word, which is queering to to queer uh, a place as a verb. I think we try to, to make a statement that we don't have to start from scratch, but we need to open a history that has been silenced. So, so for instance, opening at the history in Bloomsbury, this is a protection of the narrative. This is a reopening of the narrative that many people, even members of the queer communities might be unaware of. And I think by reclaiming that history and retelling that story as with the work of Dr. Kit Hayem and their colleagues, for instance, it's a way to protect, uh, even in a DIY practice, that's a protection of, of that uh, story.
that we need to preserve. Wonderful, thank you both. Um, so we've got a couple of questions here about um, the content of the report. So does the report cover how we queer transport hubs and interchanges or how we might make transport choices more queer friendly? Um, as a, as a follow-on to that, there was a separate question about um, about parks and green spaces as well and how they can be made more inclusive. So if we can couple those two together. Can I just a, a quick comment before I give to people? Maybe maybe even you can help us because you work also on the cycling and uh, this is a way of mobility, but people please, uh, if you want to, to go first. I think that um, we're conscious that we're only really scratching the surface in this first report. So um, we haven't talked as much about uh, transport hubs like railway stations or um, bus interchanges or uh, whatever as uh, we perhaps should do. We haven't talked about safety actually physically on public transport, although that's clearly an issue. Um, and of course, with, there was a uh, rather appalling hate crime incident in the street in North London the other day. Um, so um, from motor vehicles. Uh, so there are all kinds of issues which need to be uh, addressed there as well. Um, and I think that's that's research we, we perhaps need to go into. We do touch upon green spaces rather more. Um, and I, I think that uh, in general, um, uh, the, the view is that historically parks have been queer spaces. Uh, if you think about it, uh, where do you go for illicit sex historically? And of course, you know, queer sex is by its very nature illicit sex where you go to the park. Um, you go to Boswell's memoirs, that's, that's where he went for illicit sex with prostitutes and things like that in the 18th century. Um, so. Um, and you know, there, are, you know, there are green spaces to the on the outskirts of cities or within cities where this kind of thing has happened. Indeed, um, uh, his name, uh, uh, Jonas Andresen, who uh, works on the um, uh, Re Regency Squares in London, has pointed out that in recent times the gentrification of those squares the way in which they've turn, been turned into heritage assets have reduced, has reduced the way in which they're also queer spaces. They've been made much more regular, the sight lines have been opened up, there aren't so many bushes. Um, and if, if I can sort of touch upon such things. Um, and uh, so some of these spaces where, which used to be places of queer hookups um, and cruising have ceased to be so. Uh, so in that sense, the way in which you design and manage park spaces, uh, the way in which you police these park spaces, um, so the great uh, case study of uh, the management of car parks in Toronto, which draws it, 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 our attention to exactly this, um, all tend to uh, either produce more or less queer friendly spaces. Was there anything that you wanted to add to that, Amar? I think just like uh, somebody published an article about our report yesterday at the Arctic Journal, and I think that the article includes some of the comments by people I, I really don't know, but uh, they have been invited to reflect on the report. And uh, I think one co colleague mentioned the question of mobility and movement and the transportation, because very often it's not only about the venue that has to be queer, but also how do you reach that place? Uh, how do you leave that place? Um, so it has been published yesterday for people who are interested to know more a little bit about this by the Arctic Journal. Um, um, maybe I can drop the link in a second. Thank you. Wonderful. There's Thank one you. thing to, to add to that. that you know, the, the, there's a lot of literature which privileges the idea of the gayborhood as a safe space, um, but the evidence suggests that actually gayborhoods also tend to attract hate crimes rather than necessarily being safe. And because they tend, they're also uh, spaces where a lot of queer people can't afford to live. You still need to use public transport to get there. Um, and that is uh, seen as a way of placing yourself in a vulnerable situation because a lot of public transport is not 
um, a queer inclusive space. So, um, and uh, the, the, the thinking about, I mean, Amal was ref referring to putting um, rainbow flags on crossings and things like that, but you've not got rainbow flags in streetcars or um, on railway stations or tube stations or whatever, um, and um, uh, or very rarely, and that uh, might be another way in which you can actually design in diversity. Um, if you think about it, transport hubs tend to be very much monocultures in terms of the way in which they're designed. Um, they tend to be very crowded spaces um, and uh, they often have very large echoing concourses. So you will, if you're queer in those spaces, you will tend to stand out. Um, so they're not necessarily very clear, queer inclusive spaces. Wonderful, thank you. I'm going to group another couple of questions that have come in. So the first one was um, about uh, how do we get these messages across to decision, ma decision makers in such uh, in areas such as planning, uh, where, which are dominated by straight while uh, straight male demographics. Um, and the second one was, uh, what challenges do you see in client side organisations identifying and prioritising queer queering public spaces in design and cost? I think in reflection to the first question, it's really by engaging with different uh, people and different organisations. Uh, so people know, uh, I think we're pre presenting, for instance, to the um, uh, to different people, maybe you can tell more uh, about this, um, but also about diversifying the workforce in these uh, places, in, in planning, in the city councils, in the, in, in the profession, I think diversifying the workforce and engaging with the communities that would really influence the decision making when, when we talk to the people who are supposed to be serving and when we have uh, members of these communities within the workforces in, in different organizations um, and also thinking about the intersectionality so it, it doesn't stay, remain uh, all white uh, male dominant uh, profession. Yeah. So if you look at Australia, um, in states like New South Wales, if there is a large local minority population, their needs need, have to be taken into account in impact assessments. Um, so if, you, um, if you're planning something in some of those communities, you have to, uh, you have to take into account that there's a large local queer community. Um, or a large local ethnic minority community and things like that. We don't have that in the UK, um, uh, but you clearly have those impacts. So there is a need to think beyond the existing uh, somewhat um, anemic statements of community engagement that we have within planning uh, frameworks to more detailed forms of planning assessment. Um, I mean, when we've done some of our work with practitioners, they have talked about doing walking tours of the of planned development for particular groups who are going to be affected in order to get their buy-in and see the site through their eyes and understand how they would traverse the site, how they would use it, what they uh, see in the plans, which you can do with CAD CAM, but you don't need the, the physical space as well. So there are lots of ways in which you could be more inclusive with, at relatively low cost. Um, and in, in the same process, you could also import some of these um, planning rules from elsewhere. I mean, what we found is that a lot of local authorities, because it's um, discretionary rather than mandatory, are not currently engaging with statements of community engagement um, and that I think is is not best practice. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so I think we've got someone with their hand up. Um, if the if we're able to unmute Steve, then Steve did you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a very thought-provoking presentation, so thanks very much for those. Um, clearly, some of the issues which have been discussed are, you know, you know, political matters, they're cultural issues, 
you know, which which need uh, attention, which goes way beyond um, highway design, public space design, um, and, and, and clearly there's a debate required on that. And uh, I've been listening to Amars and Pippa's answers to some of the last questions about um, design, and I, I've still not got this clear picture in my head about what it is that makes design add value or add benefit to the the queer communities um because because to me from my perspective i think that if you're designing in a way that attracts people uh and you're getting a, a strong mix of people in public spaces then that is one of the best ways of, of making them safer um you know you talk about cozy corners um you know to me cozy corners can can seem quite insecure as well i but i think why, why, i mean clearly there's clever design which which might allow cozy corners to be designed in a way which you know does make them attractive and safe but i haven't got that feel yet as to whether there's anything different about queer design or whether it's just good design which attracts this vast diversity of public to, to, to be present in those places can I respond to that in two ways? I mean, um, in terms of addressing the politics, we are going to be taking this roadshow on to Parliament and places like that. Um, in terms of your point about what's distinctively queer about it, in many ways, what's queer about it is challenging the existing structures. We're not trying to, uh, to say queers need to be privileged. Because I think if you start saying that, then you trigger all those kind of socially conservative um, reactions against, quote, woke people, etc., which the current government have used so well in the form of fear mongering. Um, what we're trying to talk about is being exclusive, inclusive for everyone. So if you look at research which has been done, conducted on what makes for a more feminist city, a more uh, a female inclusive city, a more gender inclusive city. They've talked about the need to have more face to face intimate spaces. Um, so this is not about uh, queer spaces, it's, a, it's about what makes people feel that they've got a degree of privacy in public space. Obviously you can't design out all uh, tendencies towards uh, hate crime but given what we know about the perpetrators of, uh, of hate crime there are ways in which you can reduce that not just for queer communities but for all those people with protected characteristics who are liable to be attacked in these kinds of spaces so in the end if you look at the final paragraph of the report we end up saying in many ways what we're talking about is simply good design and that's the point Good design should be inclusive for everyone. Public space should be for everyone, not just for cis white males. Discuss. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm conscious of time. Um, I think I think we've come to the end of um the time allotted there, there was a there, i think that there, there's a couple of other questions but perhaps if we can take your details um from ciht afterwards and and respond to those uh, directly um but uh, I, I think i'll hand back over to i, I don't know if um ramon whether or not there were any other sort of closing statements that you needed to um I think there's another slide potentially. Um, um, yeah, just like to like to remind all the attendees that are remaining that uh, these are the, the websites. Um, if you want to uh, query anything regardless, uh, regard, regarding like membership, please um, use this address or any other um, uh, you know um, ideas you want to see in these sort of webinars we organize uh, in the West Midland uh, region. Please uh, email one of these addresses and. If you, as like Maggie mentioned, if you want to um, um, follow up on any questions on regarding this webinar or any any other business, please uh, you can contact also this this address in the bottom. So yeah, thank you all very very much. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Pipa, um, Amar, and Maggie for your this fantastic presentation. I think it's one of the best we've had. So.
I'm just looking forward to seeing more what, what you, got, you have on the pipeline for, for, for this. So thank you all very much and see you very soon.